Why is it that Croydon is so often the butt at the end of a bad joke? It could be the 2011 riots or the infamous New Addington Estate, nicknamed Little Siberia. Perhaps it's plain old class prejudice lurking behind derogatory slurs such as the Croydon facelift. But undoubtedly it has something to do with the acres of high-rise, concrete, car-dominated, largely commercial and often vacant 60s architecture. bad reputation generally. People hear the name Croydon, they're often likely to say it in a slightly sneery way. They're not necessarily going to talk about Croydon in glowing terms. Now when people think of Croydon they think about Ikea, they think about Wellesley Road, they probably think about Fairfield Halls because they've probably seen a panto there at some point. One of the reasons that Croydon's got this reputation is all the post-war rebuilding. I feel like there is a sense that Croydon got up above its station that it became too ambitious and therefore became a bit of a joke. Being the first doesn't mean you're the best. It means you kind of make, you're often the ones that are making the mistakes as well that others then learn from. Well, the history of Croydon's planning is, it's also a kind of history of non-planning. You know, I've got this great photograph I show of the two original master planners at that little model of, of Croydon where they thought it was a really good idea to have a dual carriageway We're running down the middle of a city. There was a, a very powerful local politician um, called uh, Sir James Marshall. He was responsible for a lot of the really big changes that happened in Croydon. He was hugely ambitious for the town and for himself and wanted to try and transform Croydon from a fairly small market town into a great big kind of powerhouse in South London. I don't think before or since there's been one person that's had that amount of influence in Croydon. It was pretty much a sort of one-man campaign. He really saw himself as a sort of the singular figure that was going to make all the difference. He was like a real fixer, you know, he was almost like a sort of mafia boss. Marshall was extremely ambitious and set his sights on making Croydon a forward-thinking, modern city of the future. He pursued this goal with single-minded aggression and in 1956 forced through the Croydon Corporation Act, a bill which allows him to circumvent planning laws, demolishing and rebuilding the entire city centre. However, the real opportunity arose with the 1963 Brown ban. George Brown, then Deputy Prime Minister, blocked the erection of tall buildings in central London, and growing businesses soon turned to Croydon as an alternative. Marshall and his cronies simply sat back and watched six million square feet of office space shoot up, as a commercial feeding frenzy descended on the town. You can imagine how excited people were at that the time when all of this stuff was happening. In a very short period of time, around about 10 years, where it went from you know, sleepy market town to city of the future. For the people of Croydon though, seeing your town dug up and transformed from what were just, you know, semi-detached houses, schools, and stuff that, got, that turned into suddenly this enormous business district. It must have been, must have been a phenomenal uh, site. But Croydon was where it's at, or where it was. Working for Nestle, well, it was, I say, it was all new to us. So the first thing that we did when we got into the block was made a beeline for the, for the lift to get up to the 22nd floor to see the view, which was incredible, really. We'd never experienced anything like an office block like that. Um, 22 floors with a canteen, staff shop, medical centre, all sorts of things. It was in its own little world, really. And we could see buildings going up all in Croydon. Um, and it was beginning to look a bit like New York. A building I, um, I particularly like is Lunia House, uh, because I think it's quite emblematic of the spirit of the, that age. The, the name of the building reminds the, uh, the landing on, on the moon, and it has a sort of framed uh, fake windows on the top. I say fake windows because they just frame the sky. These windows are attached to the structure as wings. Uh, to fly, uh, to fly to the sky, which was the, the main ambition of, of, of people of that age, to, to reach the progress and uh, the ambition of reaching the sky. 
The forms of the buildings are beautiful. I mean, I really like the 60s. I love the Nestle Tower. I like the 60s high-rise. I love Luna House and Apollo House. There are some excellent buildings in Croydon that, that get ignored partly because too many of them were built. And as a result, you can, if you're walking around East Croydon, you can't see one building for the next building because they're all in the way. It's fair to say that, that there wasn't a great deal of planning that went into where they went or what they were or how they related to one another. I think even at the time that led to lots of criticisms from the architectural press about the fact that they didn't seem to be a coherent aesthetic eye sort of overseeing this change and that it was commercially driven and, and brash and that's because it was. When Croydon was first developed it was like definitely a satellite city. So it was designed so they could get in, park their cars, go to work and leave and go. It was just focused on, um, on work, on working life. And that was, I think, a lack of uh, attention on what really people need in a place. OK, you need to work, but you need to have public space as well, which has been forgotten during the, the regeneration in the 60s. If you walk around that at ground level, doesn't make any sense. It's all ramps going down underneath buildings and surface car parks and buildings on stilts. So there isn't really anything happening at your level other than sort of mess. Marshall's uncontested power meant that his word went and his priority was pure and simple, to make money from the building boom. But as the city centre was overtaken with monolithic office blocks, the pedestrian realm was increasingly unfriendly, uncomfortable and dangerous. Marshall's solution was characteristically capitalist, to create a new public realm in a shopping district. Unlike Wellesley Road, the three vast shopping centres and commercial high street he created were pedestrian friendly and easily navigated, but is commercial space an adequate substitute for civic space? In the warm, air-conditioned bubble of a mall, the citizen is reduced to a consumer, only able to participate in public life through spending money. Croydon really was built for affluent people. You know, James Marshall wanted to attract a lot of middle-class people to the town, working in financial services and office jobs. It's all about consumerism, and if you don't have any money, but that is your town centre, and that's all it has, you feel really alienated by it. What you've got is a, a baseline of a, like a halo of a commercial area. So there are very few residents that live here now, like none. Instead of funding play centres or schools, things like car parks were being funded in the centre of Croydon, and that was where the money was going. It wasn't going into sort of working class housing. In the excitement of the building boom, Marshall didn't consider the legacy of his project. His vision, though lucrative in the short term, ultimately failed Croydon. In the mid-1970s, a massive financial crisis forced building work to grind to a halt. And as the cheaply and hastily constructed architecture started to show its age, big business abandoned Croydon and relocated to newer, flashier premises in Canary Wharf. As quickly as it had flourished, Croydon went into decline. Actually, the biggest issue we're dealing with is, is the original concept was around commercial, and actually, that's not what it's going to be at all. That's not what it's growing up to be. It's becoming a very um, diverse piece of city. Today, with one in eight office buildings standing empty, Marshall's vision is in tatters, having proved short-termist and self-interested. But for every carbuncle in Croydon, there's also something remarkable and even beautiful. Strange juxtapositions make this place unique as well as challenging. And the council is rediscovering something of that bold architectural vision. They are determined to keep the best of the past while nurturing a new long-term approach to urban development. One that is inclusive, collaborative and generous.